everyone thinks, oh my God, you know, what you're talking about could be the possibility of not just, you know, the total war like we see in Ukraine, which is bad enough for the Russians and Ukrainians that are, that, that are involved in it, but, you know, for the entire world and the possibility of, of weapons of mass destruction, that sounds, that sounds truly terrible. And, and it is, it is terrible. Um, on the other hand, you say, what if the alternative to that would have all of the trends today that you see, right? Continuing for the next hundred years, rich get richer, poor get poorer, governments become less effective. Um, you know, we, we have no public health anymore because no one obeys anybody anymore, right? I mean, you, you think about that, right? Put every trend we have now on a fast forward mechanism and you think, how desirable is that future? Sort of something, I don't know, what would you call it? Blade Runner? <laughs> kind of a Blade Runner world out there. But but that's my poem. A lot of people would think, well, that just sounds terrible, right? But this is what this is why it's important to look at social change and the rules of social change and patterns of social change. Sometimes you need one thing for the other good thing to happen. On today's episode of the What the Finance Podcast, I have the pleasure of welcoming on Neil Howe, uh, who's the co-author of the groundbreaking book, The Fourth Turning, uh, and author of the recent release, or it's not it's not released yet, I think it's uh, 10 days or so is being released. Uh, the book, The Fourth Turning is here, what the seasons of history tell us about how and when this crisis will end, which I've got a copy right here and I'm enjoying it very much so far. So Neil, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Well, thank you for having me on. No problem. I'm really looking forward to uh, talking to you because as I was saying sort of before we got on air, I, I enjoyed The Fourth Turning. I'm really enjoying this book so far, which I'm still getting through. Uh, and I guess my first question is uh, maybe for anyone who hasn't had the opportunity to read uh, your original work, can you maybe give us a quick overview of, of the seasons of history and, and what The Fourth Turning is and, and maybe why they should pay attention to it? Well, you know, I... Uh, a lot of what I do is, is conventional, you know, sort of economic forecasting and demography. Uh, you know, and I'm, I, I can talk about uh, fer fertility and, and, and mortality and morbidity and migration and all the rest uh, and, and run out projections. Uh, but this is a special project of mine, which is really interpreting uh, demographic, dem demographics in a somewhat different sense. And it's looking strongly at uh, the effect of generational membership on how people behave as they grow older and the kind of the social, political, civic, cultural dimensions of that. And in fact, to, to be even broader, how, how these uh, generational effects, how, how generations are shaped young by history and later on as parents and leaders shape history, how that in fact gives a certain rhythm uh, and pattern to history itself. Now that's that's a bigger agenda, right? And I got into this as sort of an avocation many years ago, actually in the late 1980s, uh, with the co-author William Strauss, and we wrote a book called Generations: The History of America's Future. But Generations was a book that was uh, that that basically consisted of a set of uh, collective. Uh, biographies of American generations, starting back in the Great Migration from England to, uh, to, uh, to, to New England in the 1630s, right? And that was sort of the birth of the, the, uh, uh, the, the Massachusetts Bay Colony in Plymouth and, and expansion of Plymouth and all the rest. So, so and, and we go and we went forward, right? And we went generation by generation. And, and what we did, no one has done this before, actually looking at, um, at history, not the way most historians look at history um, uh, is as a, um, they look at people of all ages every year, whatever they're doing. So, you know, in, in 1851, they'll look at, you know, what 10 year olds are doing and 30 year olds are doing and 90 year olds are doing. And then 10 years later, they'll look at all of that. So, um, but then you, you wonder, well, what's the connection between what 40 year olds were doing in 1820 and what 60 year olds are doing in 1860? Those are the same people. 
Did we forget that, right? Did we forget that? Um, and amazingly enough, historians never look at that question. The actual continuity of the same people is completely forgotten to the historian. Now, occasionally you will see historians do a history of childhood or a history of old age. And they'll, they'll cover 10 year olds, you know, from one year to the next. <laughs> of course, they're still, you know, different people. Now, mainly what historians do is they cover, you know, the, the history of 50 and 60 year olds <laughs> because they're, they're the political leaders, the military leaders, and the social leaders. But what we wanted to do is look at history completely differently. We wanted to look at history according to the diagonal, right? So if you have, if you imagine age on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, we all live a diagonal line, right? And a group of us live this very broad diagonal line. And we age through different phases of life at different dates. No one has ever told history as the story of each of those groups layered on top of each other. As, um, as uh, Jean Maltre, who actually wrote a, a, a great book in, in 1920, part of the great you know, rediscovery and, and, and uh, of, of generational thinking in the 1920s, he wrote a book called the Les Générations Sociales, which is, you know, he coined the word social generation to look at this. And he likened successive generations, and I love this metaphor, he called them tiles on a roof. Isn't that perfect? Diagonal lines, right? Tiles on a roof. And that's how history moves, right? And you think of our own lives today, right? We belong to different groups, depending on when we're born. We, we, we're so aware of it, we sometimes give it terms. You know, we talk about millennials or Gen Xers or boomers and whatever. Uh, we talk about the greatest generation and how they live their life. Well, one thing that, that Bill and I did is we wrote a book where we had these generational biographies and this is what we discovered. First of all, that people have always been aware, even back in the 17th century of generational differences, right? And that, and that the, the, the founders were very different from the second generation who came along right after them. Uh, a generation who came of, comes of age during a war, sees that war and sees the events of the rest of their life very differently than the generation who were children during that war, you know what I mean? And that, and that, first of all, so that's the first big lesson. The second big lesson is, and this was the exciting one for us, is that these generational differences are not random. There's an actual pattern in which certain kinds of generations follow another. For example, boomers, you know, everyone knows they came to bay during this period of great kind of cultural awakening uh, and all these new age movements and sort of rediscovery of the self and the soul and transcendental meanings of everything. And um, and the generation after them, Gen X has this reputation as hard nosed, pragmatic, bottom line, just show me the money, you know, all of that. And that that shift is repeated again and again in history, meaning after a generation like boomers who come of age during these awakening periods, you always get this kind of cynical reaction. After a generation of, of Abraham Lincolns, you get a generation of Ulysses Grants. You know what I mean? I mean, that's how it works. And, and similarly, after um, uh, we, we see this in similar, similarly when you, when you have a, uh, other generations, other locations, and so that was a rhythm of generational differences, and this is the key. And then I'll and then I'll stop talking for a second. But this rhythm of generations is also associated with the rhythm of history itself. And many people have noticed in American history these enormous outer world civic political uh, institutional upheavals that have happened about once every human lifetime. And most recently in American history, it's known to us, you know, we have the American Revolution, then we have the Civil War, then we had you know, the Great Depression and World War II, and here we are today, right? I mean, each of these a very similar length of time. And roughly halfway in between these great crises, we have the great awakenings of American history, right? And there you have it, right? You have two different antipodes. You might even say two different equinoxes. Right. Let's imagine the crisis, the public crisis being the winters, right? Starting off with the winter solstice and imagine the awakenings being the summers. And by the way, this goes back into, we, we actually, you know, look at this in terms of what we call 
you know, maybe euphemistically Anglo-American history, but we take this back into um, uh, uh, British and English history, uh, back through the Glorious Revolution, we take it back into, um, uh, you know, the Spanish Armada, we take it all the way back to the War of the Roses, for God's sakes. And and we see that, again, half, we have the Great Awakening, the Protestant Reformation, we have the Great Puritan Reformation. So, so this is an amazing pattern. And it's associated with many switches and many rhythms in cultural life and in social life. Um, our tendency to value community over the individual, for example. Um, uh, periods of high social disorders, or periods of low social disorder. Um, and and all the rest of it. We you know we go through um, you know patterns of, of Kondratiev waves. We go through the K wave economic cycle, and we look at um, the 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 patterns of realigning elections in American history. And well, you you've been through the book. You you know all the stuff we look at. And then what the real payoff of, of this book is. And I, I say we 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 did this in our in, in generations, but we did it as you mentioned. Uh, a little bit more forcefully looking at, at cycles of history, we did it in The Fourth Turning, which came out in 1997. This new book has a much more closer look at exactly where we are today. And, um, and not only looking at how this fourth turning is likely to end uh, in the late 2020s and early 2030s, but where we're going after that. What's the next first turning going to look like, right? So, so that's... That's kind of where you are. And I would say if you want to know what 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 I've gained in this way of looking at history generationally and looking at the interaction between generations and history, it's a it's kind of a four part model uh, of of seasonality of history and and a succession of sort of what I call generational archetypes, different kinds of generations which push that forward in a completing cycle because history shapes generations and generations shape history on a timeline, right? Yeah, it, it, it's amazing when you, to hear you explain it. So um, you've mentioned that, that there's a seasons and then there, there, there's these archetypes of different types of generations that come from the different seasons. They're sort of influenced by what they experience, which makes a lot of sense. So maybe can you just give us a quick explanation of those different seasons and maybe the archetypes that that would create? Well, I mean, uh, you know, you have the... Uh, the, the spring season is what we call the first turning. That's a post-crisis era. And these usually tend to be eras in which um, uh, community is valued, in, uh, individualism is devalued, uh, in, institutional life is very strong and compelling, and people feel like they're living in a society which is greater than the sum of its parts. Meaning, as individuals, we aren't very much, but my God, you know, we're going to create something really great together, right? A, a sense which we absolutely do not have today, <laughs> right? So that's the first turning mood, and um, uh, these are these are these are periods in which you know nonconformity is shunned. I mean, people really are. These are periods of, of a great deal of uh, of, um, of of group think. In fact, they're ridiculed for that. Uh, not only afterwards, but even as it's happening, <laughs> it's ridiculed for that. And then uh, the 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 first turnings are followed by uh, the second turning, the summer, and that's the awakening. Those are the periods I talked to you before about in 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 American and 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 English history. We we actually give numbers to these awakenings. Certainly in American history, we talk about the first great awakening with well, actually, you can even talk about the Puritan awakening as the first great awakening with Jonathan Wint, you know, with with, with uh, John Winthrop. Uh, the second with uh, with uh, sometimes called the first great awakening with Jonathan Edwards in the 1740s and then um, the the second great awakening that occurred in the you know late 1820s and 1830s and, and so on 1890s and then and with the 1960s and 70s which many historians call America's fifth great awakening right and there you have it Right. I mean, th that that's when people tire of social conformity. They want to throw off social discipline. They want to find a new sense of personal authenticity and society right around that point becomes more individualistic. Robert Putnam, who's probably America's most famous sociologist, wrote a probably, you know, very acclaimed book called Bowling Alone, you know, which is on America. You know, Americans used to go bowling in groups. 
we went with the Elks Club or the Kiwanis Club. And now when we go bowling, we just go bowling as individuals. You know, we just take along our, our friend or something. Um, and he said, of all of the indicators that he looks at to show this great turning away from community life to individual life, it started right around the early to mid 1960s, right around 63, 64, 65 is when it started. Um, and that is really when the awakening started, right? And, and that's how we look at that awakening. Um, and a lot of nostalgia about what happened, you know, before that awakening. There's a great line for American Graffiti. If you recall the movie American Graffiti, but the tagline of the movie poster was, where were you in 62? And 62, that was still innocence, you know? And by the time the movie came out in 1973, well, we, we all knew we were no longer innocent anymore, you know? So that became the change. And it not only was a change in the culture, hostility to a to cultural authority, you know, parents, male patriarchy, I mean, everything that was that felt like impositions, but later on became also a, a rebellion against uh, government control, you know, tax cuts, deregulation. I mean, all sides of the political spectrum took part in this, in this awakening. And then moving out of that awakening, you have the, what we call the unraveling. This is the fall season. And um, that's a period which is much the opposite of a high. Individualism is strong. Institutions are weak. Uh, these are, in American history, these are seasons of, uh, these, are, these are decades of sort of uh, cynicism and bad manners, like the 1990s, the 1920s, the 1850s, uh, decades of weak civic authority when people just, you know, let it all hang out in their individual lives. You, you, this has been true really for the past 30 years. You go into a bookstore and all the most upbeat, positive books are about me, myself, and I, right? I can do anything. I can conquer the world. But me as, a, as part of a group, well, it's just nothing but gloom and doom, right? The end of the family, the end of society, the end of politics, right? And then, of course, the winter season is where unravelings always end up. Should be nobody surprised in the story, right? And these are the great crises. And this is when we see what's happening today. Uh, the divergence of the, of the public into often two different warring partisan camps and a growth in external dangers, uh, which uh, because public action and, and functional public action has been so debilitated and undermined <laughs> by the unraveling that we can no longer really function and we can't respond to any of these dangers or threats given the institutions we have. We have to remake all of the institutions. In a period of public urgency, um, uh, uh, public mobilization, and, and creative destruction of civic life, right? And that's when we sort of remake the institutional life. And in some way that we, we sort of, you know, nature remakes itself. That would be the, the, the natural metaphor. And, and I don't know, uh, the way the archetypes line up, I think it's pretty well known. The, uh, the, the prophet archetype is, is born and raised during the high, right? During the period of conformity, the come of age during the awakening. The nomad archetype, this is the exer archetype, is raised as kids during the awakening. They come of age during the unraveling. Perfect for them. You know, that's all the lessons they learn about life is just take care of yourself. You know, <laughs> uh, it's up to you. Uh, or or, um, or uh, my favorite phrase of the 1990s, it works for me. I love that. <laughs> I really don't care if it works for you. It works for me, right? Anyway, so that's Gen X. And then millennials are born and raised during the unraveling. And they're much more protectively raised, right? Because it's an individualistic era. Everyone knows it's dangerous, right, for kids. And they are raised much more specially, and they're much they're raised much more in a, a, to have sort of communal instincts and collective instincts. 
just as boomers during the high were raised to have individualistic instincts. And they come of age during the crisis. And finally, you have a generation raised during the crisis as children. And the last time we had one of that is we, we, we call today in America the silent generation. These are people who were born in the late 1920s, 1930s, early 1940s. Uh, we have a few of them still in public life today. Joe Biden, Mitch McConnell, uh, uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi until recently. Um, they are leaving. You know, there are very few of them left now. And uh, and they have been the moderating, you know, elder edge in a way, sort of holding America back a little bit. Uh, and, and they, you know, people like Howard Baker and, and so many of the members of that generation who are known as the great conciliators, you know, known for being able to bridge gaps during the 1960s and 70s and 80s. Um, they're they're leaving now, and uh, their restraining influence uh, will no longer be present, and that adds a little bit of the edge uh, to the later stages of the crisis. Yeah, it's always fascinating to, to to hear it. So if we if we look at, I guess if we focus on today, uh, you've mentioned there that we've sort of entered this uh, crisis period. You could say, would you say that's from two thousand eight? Was that prior to that or was that really when it, it started yeah 2008 um obviously we didn't know that when we wrote the fourth turning we thought it would be sometime in the middle of the 2000 to 2010 decade well 2008 you know um and that that has proved to be a climate terror in many ways uh, in trends. You know, we move from ever greater globalization, ever greater deglobalization since 2008. We move toward ever greater democracies around the world to greater authoritarian government around the world. And, and by the way, I should mention that many of these generational crises, we're not just talking about Anglo-America, but increasingly we're talking about much of the world. You know, much of the world was shaped by the Great Depression and World War II. Much of the world experienced this uh, this uh, uh, anti civic awakening in the in the in the late sixties, seventies, probably a little bit later in the rest of the world, more like the seventies and, and early eighties. But the point is, is that this is not just America. This is global. This is not even primarily America. If you want to look at populism and uh, authoritarianism. Uh, uh, um, my gosh! Look at South America. Look at South Asia. Look at uh, look at the Philippines, China, Burma. I mean, you know, you know as well as I do that there's a rising tide around the world. But again, this started in 2008. A lot of these trends started um, uh, in 2008, and the the sense of broken politics and the sense of inescapable trend toward greater inequality that needed sort of emergency action to stop and the use of emergency government measures, right? Um, to, um, you know, whether it's quantitative easing and then quantitative tightening to all of these unprecedented levels of public debt and deficits and, and uh, uh, combination, you know, treasury and, and um, monetary authorities acting together and, and, and corralling credit and controlling the direction of credit, and freezing bank accounts. And now, of course, we have the, the, the sanctions movement that's dividing the world into different zones. This, this should so much remind people of the 1930s when you think about it. Yeah, definitely. And it sounds quite ominous, as you said, that it's like the fact that we're, obviously we're shaped by our surroundings, we're shaped by our, the previous generations, that they, they shape us. And then it's like, well, is this inevitable? Is what happened in 2008 or, you know, obviously not that specific crisis, but is this period of crises, is that inevitable or are there ways that it could be prevented? Well, I think, you know, I think fourth journeys cannot be avoided. Um, and I think it's, uh, and I, and I actually, I think if you look at this more broadly as part of a healthy, healthy functioning of society, we, we now know that, um, uh, that uh, you know, forests occasionally require fires, rivers require floods. I mean, you look at you look at complex systems in nature, and they require often these these 
they moved through these periods of punctuated equilibria, right? And everything was normal for a while, but then they required this huge reset. Um, and I and I do believe that that's true of of of, of modern societies. And and I think what happens is is that everyone believes everyone's trying to you know we all believe in progress and we're trying to change institutions so they work perfectly until we we kind of get to a stasis and then interests begin to barnacle like begin to cohere around that and we come more of a kind of a a rentier society we sort of plug ourselves into all the sinecures we no longer understand what made the original system work you know after the last crisis we no longer have that same communal impulse that we once had, right? Uh, and we all frankly become more selfish. I mean, it's as simple as that. And, and later on, that sense of collective instinct requires something drastic to be revived. Uh, and this, this happens again and again. This is something that needs to be relearned, you know, so to speak, right? Um, and I have a a number of chapters actually in the book describing the social processes by which this occurs. I mean, I talk about how in the fourth turning, we move from not just individualism to community, but we move from uh, inequality to equality, which I think is a very interesting one from today's perspective. Um, we move from uh, defiance to authority. This is time when authority becomes real, but we know, we're all familiar that crises, you know, we have we have we have wars and compulsion and you know massive organized conflict that often occurs. And this is what scares people about fourth turnings, which and, and I do agree, it's not it's it's a time to be very careful about what kind of policies you choose, but in the end, you come out of it strengthened. Um, in the eyes of everyone alive at the time, you know, what follows as a new golden age. And we become blind to that. We, we sometimes think that without any, without any different kind of environment, we can just invent our own paradise and live in it forever. That that's just not how we function. I'm I'm sorry. We're ju we're just not that good as a species to do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And and we require a process to keep us there. Um, and actually, I think that one of the one of the functions of of turnings or seasonal history is to uh, is to is to push societies out of what they're used to into a new unknown realm. I actually think this 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 helps functionality, even though people don't like crisis. In fact, people never like a new social mood, which isn't what they've been used to. Right? It's 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 always painful to move in and not only into, but through the next, the next season. Um, but yeah, that's, um, that's what we've got. Yeah. As you said, it's something that's consistent and we'll, we'll have to go through it. So if, if we look at what we've had with, uh, I guess you could say our crisis uh, period, we've had financial crisis, obviously COVID, which is probably harder pr to predict. We've had wars internationally. There's this growing movement towards, a cold war is there anything that we can look back uh from previous periods like this and we can say that we can expect that to occur as well or is the only definite that we're going to have uncertainty there are things we kind of go through a taxonomy almost of, of how crisis proceeds you know it proceeds typically through a um, a catalyst it, it, and it proceeds these periods of regeneracy when public authority is revived uh, and it often goes through more than one of those periods. Um, and, and finally, though, it reaches a consolidation and a climax when society knows that it's in um, a struggle for survival, ultimately. And that's what motivates this, this, uh, this public mobilization. Right? So the, 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 the psychology of urgency is required for the fourth turn, right? Without that, it just doesn't, it, it doesn't happen, right? You, you don't get a resolution off the other end of it. And, and ultimately then you do get the resolution. And typically, historically, these have been, you know, the treaties, the settlements, the great, the great new, um, you know, international uh, organizations or concerts or 
financial arrangements or, you know, whatever sets up this new regime that follows it, this, uh, whether it's a concert of nations, whether it's, you know, uh, uh, you know, NATO and the United Nations or whatever it is, 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 is part of a durable settlement, which then lasts for a long time. Uh, it lasts through the next, you know, two or three seasons, right? And 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 this 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 is a this is a familiar pattern. I also talk about you know what kind of conflict that usually is required, and and these often are categorized in terms of you know external versus internal conflict, and uh, you know sort of the civil war scenario versus the. Um, you know, taking on the world or taking on an external uh, actor. And and typically many of our conflicts are are a little bit of both, right? In other words, it's a little bit of uh, partly internal, partly external. A great example in American history was the, was the, uh, was the American Revolution, which uh, patriots like to think in retrospect was, you know, an, an external struggle against uh, uh, Britain. Uh, but actually, most of the fighting and dying was among colonials themselves. I mean, it was a civil war. And at the time in the 1770s and early 1780s, it was referred to part participants more often as a civil war than as a revolution. And we forget that particularly in the South, there was tremendous backcountry violence between you know, Tories and, 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 uh, and Whigs. So it's a spectrum. And very often in a civil war, the losing side wants to bring in an external power. Well, the Patriots did that. We brought in the French, right? <laughs> that's how we that's how we managed to get out from under the British. Uh, and uh, during the American Civil War, of course, the, the Confederate uh, states tried to bring in Britain and France. Uh, and uh, and and similarly, in, in, in earlier crises, we, we see we, we see the same thing. I think. It's fascinating to me that in both of these two types, you know, you look back 10 years ago um, and we weren't talking about geopolitical conflict like we are today, right? And that's like one thing that I think everyone's aware of today. Uh, we have a major land war in Europe and we have uh, a threat of something big starting out in the, in the uh, uh, in, in the in the Western Pacific, right? Similarly, ten years ago, no one even did opinion polls on the likelihood of civil war in America, right? And in the last few years, these polls have been all over the place, and you know, roughly half of Americans think one is likely. So now, whether that's just their feeling of the mood, or whether they're properly perceiving that as likelihood. The point is, is that we weren't even thinking that way, right? No one even thought about the possibility. Now we do. This is characteristic of the changes that we've seen. And this, the sense that the nation has to change to become all one thing or all the other, right? And by the way, the, those words are actually taken from Abraham Lincoln in a speech he gave in 1858. America will soon have to become all one thing or all the other. He was speaking about slavery, not slavery, you know, slavery free. Um, but it's, we often think that we've never been here before. We have been here before. <laughs> you just have to be able to recognize uh, the signs that we're here, right? Yeah, and when you look back, and I'm not, you know, I'm not sure if you've mentioned this in the book. If I think about the French, uh, the um, American Revolution, you mentioned there that the French were involved, and if we saw after that, it was the rise of sort of Napoleon and the French Empire. And then, if we look at the, um, you know, American Civil War, it was sort of after that. That was when Germany was rising. We saw the rise of the German Empire. Same after Depression, World War Two, rise of Soviet Union and and that empire. So then, is that sort of where you see China yeah, so potentially that's being? That's how it became global. And that's why I think that the reason why we start with the American cycle is because for two reasons, it's best known to Americans and Americans are very selfish. You know, Americans, they, they go anywhere and everyone speaks English, you know, everyone speaks American. And, and so they, they tend to not be terribly interested or knowledgeable about other countries. So um, I'm, you know, I'm 
perfectly honest about Americans and and all that they are and all that they aren't. Um, but it but it's you know Americans. Other countries know a lot more about America than Americans do about other countries. <laughs> let me just put it. Let me just be fair, right? So I do it because Americans know about the cycle, but I do it another reason too. It's because the cycle in America has been much more regular than other countries because we were a completely new nation separate from all others. No one else would interfere with us. And we're also a modern nation from the start. We didn't have aristocracy, kings. We didn't have clergy. We didn't have any of the stuff that impeded the rise of this cycle, which we think is, and I and I make the argument in the book, I think it's, it's uh, uh, the engine behind the cycle is a belief in progress, ironically enough. Uh, that it's, it's only a society that believes in progress, which is subject to the cycle. That's one great paradox in the book. And but those who read the book, I think you, you, you've learned that, right? I, I, I talk often about that. Um, but America is, is, is the purest expression of this cycle. And, 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 and maybe because as, as uh, Alexi de Tocqueville said in, in 1830s when he toured America, you know, he's sort of scribbling down notes. He said, more than once he said this, he said, in America, every generation is born free. Wow. Born free. You, you didn't have to follow rules. You could make your own rules. Every generation of leaders coming to power could make their own rules. And Jefferson talked at length about you didn't, you could, you could disavow all your debts, right? You <laughs> Jefferson was, was obsessed with the idea of, you know, the, 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 the dead hand of the past, you know, influencing people. This is a very common enlightenment idea. But I do think that as time went on, uh, and a big moment occurred was the American Revolution followed most decisively by the French Revolution, which had just so much of an impact on the rest of, of Europe. And then on the West Indies, and then on the rest of Latin America. I mean, it, it, all of the versions of, of the French constitutions, you know, of uh, 1789, 1791, 1795. I mean, you know, all of those were like duplicated by all of these other countries. So suddenly this was a great civic moment. This was a great crisis moment. And it ended for most of the world, certainly for Europe with Waterloo. Um, but then you begin to see, you're right. Uh, you begin to see at the time of the American Civil War was, was the, the unification of Germany, the unification of Italy, the Meiji Restoration in Japan, uh, which had, was destined to have great repercussions in, in East Asia, uh, as well as uh, some, some absolutely uh, disastrous and deadly wars in, in South America. And, you know, the, the war of the Triple Alliance, which I won't get into, but the, the, uh, kind of a, 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 t a terrible civic upheaval in South America. This all occurred around the same time. And then, of course, you move a, a, another sacrum, and then you get the, the period of trauma and troubles, which some areas some areas really began decisively with World War I. I would say that particularly was true of, 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 of Russia, because of course you had the, 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 the Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, and then the Civil War immediately after that, and then the, 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 the new economic program and the, fat, the, the purges and the famines, and, and then the World War II. I mean, it was just that was probably the mega crisis of all time. Um, tens of millions died in that, right? And, and, and much of Eastern Europe. I would say for most of the world, however, it began with uh, the Great Depression, uh, I think. And it really began with 1929, which, which flattened most of the world. And of course, brought, brought just the same kind of trend we're seeing today, populism and authoritarianism to the fore in so many areas of the world. Um, I uh, and 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 ultimately brought us into the everything from the Holocaust to 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 the total war that was that was World War II. Um and then it was over, right? Boom, it was over. And and that that has set the clock in a way uh for a for for a global generational pattern that's no longer 
particularly American anymore. You know what I mean? If if it ever was, but but I I I, I do broaden this, and I I will say that's one thing I talk about in this book much more than we did in our original book, The Fourth Turn. Yeah, definitely, and I and I guess if we look at maybe each of those crises periods and those massive wars that occur there's more more technology and there's probably more deaths that occur and you could say that's due to large populations more global if we look at maybe what they didn't have then was nuclear weapons so then if we look at today there is the threat if there were that global war the potential for, for i guess nuclear and, and is that sort of a trend that you, you see that the each time it gets worse yeah well it, it the threat is there um i wouldn't say that the worst weapons are always reused. I mean, we didn't reuse uh, gas warfare in World War II, for example. That may sound like a trivial example, but it, it's not always the rule that we always reuse the worst weapons. However, there's no question about it uh, that every total war that America's been in, or France, or, or Britain's been in, you know, going back uh, for seven centuries now, has, has been in it for turning. And every fourth turning has had a total war. So you know, sort of have no type A errors, no type B errors. You know, they're all there, right? Um, and it's also true that because they're total wars, people try to push the box in thinking of ways, ever more effective ways of bringing the conflict to a close. Um, I think it's any anyone who's familiar with the Civil War in America knows that if if either Richmond or where Washington, D.C. had possessed a weapon of mass destruction, that they would have used it in, in, in 1863 or 1864, right? And, and, in, the, and in World War II, we, we enlisted our best and brightest young people, our brainiest and, and most creative and most brilliant young people to work 24-7 to invent one in the, in the Manhattan Project which we immediately put to use, right? Now we're entering a fourth turning uh, and we've been entering a fourth turning. We're moving toward a, what will likely be a climax of a fourth turning with what, nine or 10 nations? You wanna count Iran or not? I don't know, you, you know I'll, you'll be the judge, but nine or 10 nations with, um, with, with nuclear we weapons uh, and maybe other things horrors, you know, that we haven't thought about, maybe uh, invasive nanobots or, or, uh, or, or, or viruses, or I don't know. It's obviously not the purpose of my book to judge <laughs> the technological capabilities, but to acknowledge the danger. And, and, and in the, the last chapter, where I talk a lot about what's likely to happen in the early 21st century, I, I go through sort of more positive versus more negative outcomes and what it will mean and, and whether to what extent it will, it will have an impact on the cycle itself. Um, I, I just try to look at the facts where they are. One thing I will say, though, is that one positive thing about four things is that they allow the world to reset the global rules, right? Right now, there are no global rules. I mean, anyone can do anything they want, right? And we have no, we have no concert of nations. We have no effective alliances. There's no rules to enforce anymore. Um, if we ever want to do a regime of effective control of weapons of mass destruction, such as nuclear weapons, truly effective, right? Surveillance, right? Enforcement. It would take a fourth turning to impose it. Do you understand what I mean? And by the way, I would say the same thing for a lot of the other things people often dream about, you know, like effective rules on, you know, carbon control or all these other things that people think about as being the future. It's only going to happen after an event like that, which one nation or a assortment of nations will have the authority to actually impose it on the world. I'm I'm just talking about historical experience. I'm saying those are the times at which we have succeeded in doing that. And, and the reason why that's interesting to me is that um, if you ask a lot of uh, experts in, in nuclear strategy and policy about you know, the likelihood of, of nuclear war, and they say, well, you know, accidents and misunderstandings happen all the time. 
And they often put it at about 1% per year. Well, 1% per year, well, you, you, you can go for decades, you know, and <laughs> with a pretty good chance of not experiencing something at 1% per year. But do you want to go for another 100 years at 1% per year, right? That's kind of where the course we're on now. Uh, and I would say it's going to be greater than 1% per year because pretty soon a lot more actors are going to have it, right? Have this capability. So the interesting question is, is though a fourth turning might increase the possibility that they would be used near term. It might long term be able to introduce a regime in which it would reduce the possibility that it would be used in the future. And, and the reason I say all this is because remember, the other side of a fourth turning is a golden age. You know what I mean? A great, a, a, of social order, not just domestically. But globally, yeah, it makes sense. So, uh, well, it's kind of thinking about the trade-offs here. Yeah, that's really interesting. You said that you sort of thought about like the good, I guess, the good opportunities and the and the, and the bad uh, potential events that, that could happen in the twenty first century. And... Well, let, let me, yeah, let me put it. Let me put it this way: is that everyone thinks, oh my God, you know, what you're talking about could be the possibility of not just you know the total war like we see in Ukraine, which is bad enough for the Russians and Ukrainians that are, that, that are involved in it, but, you know, for the entire world and the possibility of, of weapons of mass destruction, that sounds, that sounds truly terrible. And, and it is, it is terrible. Um, on the other hand, you say, what if the alternative to that would have all of the trends today that you see, right? Continuing for the next hundred years, Rich get richer, poor get poorer, governments become less effective. Um, you know, we, we have no public health anymore because no one obeys anybody anymore, right? I mean, you, you think about that, right? Put every trend we have now on a fast forward mechanism and you think, how desirable is that future? Sort of something, I don't know, what would you call it? Blade Runner, <laughs> kind of a Blade Runner world out there. But, but that's my poem. A lot of people would think, well, that just sounds terrible, right? But this is what, this is why it's important to look at social change and the rules of social change and patterns of social change. Sometimes you need one thing for the other good thing to happen. Um, yeah, man, that, that's a great way to put it. So that was an example of, I guess, what, what could what we could experience. What What are the other examples that you mentioned at the end of your book where, you know, obviously you don't have to give them all because you want people to go out and buy it. But what are some potential options of, we've, we've talked about war, we've talked about worse things happening, but then I guess, can you maybe... Well, you can think about a time of, 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 of tremendous uh, community and, 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 and technological renaissance where we finally be able to, you know, solve our environmental problems because we do have these global regimes that are enforced as well as... Um, create, you know, knowledge available worldwide to the, to the uh, less developed countries of the earth, maybe through a, a free worldwide web of, of, of teaching and so on and industrial processes. We can finally get, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa to, to, to join at least the middle income, if not begin to, to approach the, the, the high income uh, nation team. We could, we could have an era of um, expansion of knowledge and an, and, and an exploration of the universe, which which often happens during these first turnings. Uh, that was our last fourth turning was the, excuse me, last first turning, last spring season, was when we finally were able to launch, you know, the Apollo program to, to, to go to the moon. Uh, this was the period when, um, when some of our greatest public, uh, civically oriented, technological achievements occurred, which actually weren't just exploration of technology, though they were that as well, but there were also things which actually benefited everybody and also infrastructure that benefited everybody. Um, I would say in the last 30, 40 years, all of our commercial inventions, which we tout about being so productive, you know, like my, like my cell phone and everything else are all personal, right? We do nothing that actually enhances our public interaction. Right, our public life. 
which is why I'll have very zero or negative productivity sectors of our economy. I'll have the social dimension, education, healthcare, construction, you know, uh, neighborhood development and planning. And you just go down the list, right? The social services. Uh, and, 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 and that's why standard of living declines for most people. It's not because they can't paper their walls with flat screen TVs. Those are getting cheaper. What do they complain about? Why do they say their standard of living is no longer rising? Health insurance, education, housing. <laughs> and these are all social activities, right? These are socially, these aren't just a more efficient gadget. And I think that aspect of life about be becoming more satisfying social experience and a more community-oriented experience. And I, I talked a lot about that in the last chapter, <clears throat> about how much of what the first turning promises on the other side of a fourth turning is a sense of belonging that is almost pathologically absent in today's societies. We, we talk, you know, um, uh, you know, Angus Deaton talks about midlife uh, deaths of despair. Uh, and we talk about the epidemic of loneliness, the, the, the sort of the, the paralyzing unhappiness that people feel about not belonging to anything today. This is a problem hugely solved in the fourth turning, right? Um, now, like, like every turning up is perfect, there will be complaints about how that problem is solved. You understand it? it th th there's always a new tension that's introduced, right? But that problem, which besets us all today, and I think millennials most of all. What do the millennials always complain about? FOMO. I mean, if there's one generation that really wants to be able to interact more constructively and effectively with its peers, that's that generation. So this is this, these, these problems are solved. And that's what I try to do in this book to walk through the social process by which that happens. Yeah, and I think you've done a great job with that. So, Neil, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Uh, my, my last question is, uh, what is one message you'd like people to take away from our conversation and maybe your book as well? I think we were kind of edging toward it toward the end, um, is that the book is intended to give people a sense of where we are in history. If, if, I, if I were to say that one problem we all face today, and as I talk to people, it's a sense that everything is going wrong. Nothing works like we remember it working. We all feel disoriented. We also feel detached from our parents and detached from our kids because the world is constantly changing, supposedly progressing, but in any event, it gives us no connection with what comes after, that we all feel desperately alone and desperately disconnected. Um, and I and I and my my big message in the book is that it's not hardship, which is difficult for humans. I think we're genetically hardwired for hardship. I think we're very good at at withstanding hardship. We're really very good at at that. What we cannot stand is hardship without purpose, without meaning. We have no idea where it's going or where it's leading. And I think that this is a perspective which give people maybe a better sense that it, it does all lead somewhere. And then in addition, as we were beginning to talk about a period which seems very difficult because it's leading to these things, right? Which seem very dangerous and very perilous. And, and to some extent they are. Um, our, our challenges that are surmountable um, and more importantly, have a huge potential to lead to someplace much better than we now are. I think that's a great message to take away from our <laughs> bit of a doom and gloom is look at looking past that and and that you have to go through that sometimes to then get the the better society that we're just like in our personal life, right? Exactly, exactly. So Neil, thanks, thanks again for your time. So we, uh, we mentioned that your book's been released soon, if I'm not mistaken, the 17th of July. So yeah. is that correct? Yeah, 18th, July 18th, I think, but you know, whatever. Oh, sorry. It'll, it'll be on. <laughs> Yeah, I'll be up there. So I'll put it in the description below and I'd recommend everyone uh, go out and buy it once it's available. But thanks again for your time. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and click the bell icon so you're notified when new podcasts are released. I hope you're leaving with some great value about investing, trading and finance. See you on the next show.